Go. Hello, everyone. I'm Okay, so the talk's going to be um, kind of, I guess, two talks, I suppose. So uh, firstly, I'll, I'll give a bit of context about um, some of the work that, um, that I do in Antarctica, and, and a lot of the talk will actually be, be based on a lot of other people's research. Um, and then after that, um, once I've talked about some of the challenges we face in Antarctica and in global, globally with climate change, um, then um, talk a little bit about um, what we can do to empower the next generation to ensure that they don't make the same mistakes that a lot of us have made. Um, so that's a, that's a bit of an overview, and, and um, if anyone's got any questions um, throughout the way, feel, feel free to, um, to just put your hand up. Okay, so just briefly, um, we're going to sort of do a, a quick intro around our own climate change. So um, what we have is, is a carbon cycle where things are released and then buried and deposited. And at the moment, um, the equilibrium is starting to change because we have added a lot of the fossil carbon that has been stored <coughs> in our sediments that have been buried over millions of years. They're now being released and being burned. And so now we've pumped all of this extra carbon into the carbon cycle, so it's no longer in equilibrium. And so that means that it has to readjust. So what we've got now is, is we're starting to see, the first time in human history, a readjustment of this equilibrium. And that's why we're starting to see some of these um, intense and adverse changes in um, all around the world. Um, and, and that's going to continue to happen as, as we continue to shift um, and rebalance out this equilibrium, um, which we're at the moment nowhere near. So um, just to kind of give a bit of context around the carbon dioxide and, and the challenge that we've got there, what, what we see, this is the uh, carbon dioxide record from Mauna Loa in Hawaii, which is the, um, the longest standing um, atmospheric carbon dioxide record that we have on the planet. Um, and quite obviously, you can see since it was started to started to get recorded in the, in the late fifties, um, it continues to rise, and that wiggle fluctuates year by year with the, with the seasons. As, as trees are, as trees are in fall and in winter, there's no longer trees, so they're not absorbing as much carbon. And also, especially in the northern hemisphere, where you're burning a lot more carbon, you see these spikes, and so that's why you see this seasonal fluctuation of these zigzags. Um, with, with each year as it kind of goes up and down. And so if we go a little bit further back into this record, what we have here is the, the ice core records from Antarctica. Um, so the blue at the, at the top is that is the atmospheric record that we have from, from the 50s. And then the red, you see this significant spike from the, uh, from the ice core record at Lord Dome. And then we go further back to, to Taylor Dome, and we see um, it's been quite consistent um, between sort of two, 270, 280 for the last 12,000 years or so. And then we see this significant spike after from pre-industrial once we started to burn all of this, all of this carbon. And so if we go even further back, what we have here is the 800,000 year ice core record um, fluctuating every 100,000 years or so, um, which are the, the natural cycles of glacial, interglacial, or ice age and, and warm periods. So we, so we see this natural fluctuation over time um, between about 180 and, two, and 280 parts per million. Um, and then of course, this significant spike taking us up above 300 for the first time in over 800,000 years, and now up over 400 and as you see um, that potentially could continue to rise if we don't um, if we don't significantly reduce our emissions um, and I like to show this like this nice image of, of Claude Laureus because uh, he's, he's a glaciologist ice core expert um, and in, in, in the 70s uh, he was drinking whiskey in Antarctica and the the way he found out that we could actually measure the, the air bubbles in the ice cores was he had, he had these um, ancient um, ice cubes and he saw this, the whiskey started to bubble up and then he had this, this idea, oh actually, 
if we have these fossil records of the atmosphere, then the ice cores that we can measure. So drinking can actually give us a great idea sometimes, <laughs> apparently. Um, so so this, is, this is what we're working with from a, from a, um, a historical record with the atmosphere, um, and this is how we can um, kind of use the past to help us inform what sort of pathway we might be looking at and, and how things are significantly different today than they have been for a long time. Um, so just to, to illustrate the importance of that carbon dioxide record, hopefully this works. There we go. Okay, so this is that same curve over 800,000 years with the carbon dioxide. And what you see is when you match the temperature record with that, it's almost exactly the same. And so we know that carbon dioxide and temperature are very coupled. But what we see at the moment in Earth's history, or, or, or currently, is the CO2 levels at 400, but the temperature hasn't, hasn't quite caught up yet. So we're not sure how long that might take, but we, we know for sure that we're going to see some of that change or some of that equilibrium continue to shift with this significantly higher CO2 record. And so that's, that's quite an uncertain future that we have at the moment. Um, so, what we're working with at the moment really is we are likely to be committed to a world that's more than two degrees um, based on our current climate policies. It just seems more realistic, um, which of course means several meters of sea level rise. Um, at the moment, we still have a choice. We can still decide what future we want. Um, and so, what we have on the right here are some of the pro projections that um, we have, so the fossil CO2 emissions on the, in the top figure, and the temperature in the bottom. And so what we have there is uh, the blue line representing um, the, the up to, I just have to take this up to about 2015-ish, 20, I think, and then, and then it gets forecasted into the future. So the blue line is if we aggressively reduce emissions and try to stay under 1.5 degrees. Um, which is probably extremely difficult to do. And then the red line is sort of Trump style approach where you just burn everything and see what happens. Um, and you can see that it takes us into a very dangerous world in the second half of, of this uh, century and we exceed two degrees and then continue to keep shooting up and up and up. Um, and so we'll probably end up somewhere, hopefully in between those two, much lower at the lower end. Um, but again, the next 10 years, as you see with this curve, really determine if we decide to kind of shoot up in a, in a non-linear fashion or we can um, continue to have a, a, a sort of a slow and steady um, increase and then hopefully draw down a lot of that carbon um, in the second half of this century. So this is the sort of um, futures that, that we have to decide as a, as a global community um, and what can we do and what options do we have to try and figure out the best pathway for those. So we, what we can do is we can use geological data from the past to help us inform how quickly some of these changes might happen and what sorts of um, conditions we might expect if we continue to go on a certain trajectory. So um, geologists can look at the past environments and, and and different marine and terrestrial sediments to try and understand how things have behaved. Um, and, and so what we've got here are some comparable analogues to a uh, future that we might live in. So at present on the left we have a, um, a intact Antarctica and an intact Greenland. And, but what we see there is the CO2 has shot up um, and it's about at one degree of warming from pre-industrial. Um, if we go back 125,000 years, the last interglacial or the last warm period comparable to today, um, carbon dioxide levels didn't go above 280, but we were at one degree of warming similar to today, but we have six to nine meters more sea level with um, parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet and, and, and parts of Greenland um, retreating or, or losing ice mass. So we know that 
our current system is a lot warmer than that, yet the Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland haven't caught up or they haven't yet lost all of this ice. So we may in fact be committed to that amount of ice mass loss. We don't know how quickly these sorts of things might take. We don't know, there's still a lot of uncertainties as to why this was the case, even though carbon dioxide levels were comparable to, um, well, were much lower than today. Um, and then again, similar sort of situation with um, 400,000 years ago, um, slightly more ice because we lose much more of Greenland, um, similar chunks of West Antarctica, but the challenge with Antarctica is there's very limited evidence for this because most of the continent is covered in ice or the, uh, the sites we're trying to get to, you have to drill very deep into the oceans. So getting evidence for this is extremely difficult. Um, much like I like to compare it to uh, being a detective where if you imagine you've got um, a book, 90% of the pages have been ripped out and you've got 10% of the pages left and you have to try and figure out how parts of the book um, work together. Geology is very similar. We have these scattered pieces of, of sediment or, or um, evidence that we have to try and stitch together and, and paint a, a, a climate history, if you like. Um, and then the really interesting um, time period was the, the mid pliocene warm period about 3 million years ago where we may have lost all of Greenland and, and again a large part of the West Antarctic ice sheet carbon dioxide levels similar to today, 400 ppm and um, we have at least 6 metres, possibly more than 20 metres um, depending on, on the estimates uh, of sea level rise um, and 2 to 3 degrees warming um, relative to uh, pre-industrial so these are some of the time periods that we use in, as examples or um, tools for us to then help forecast how the future might look. Um, and so one of the interesting things is this was a paper from, from John Merce in 1978, so you know, more than 40 years ago. And his prediction was that uh, I'll just read the abstract. If global consumption of fossil fuels continues to grow at its present rate, atmospheric CO2 content will double in about 50 years. Climatic models suggest the resultant greenhouse warming effect will be greatly magnified in high latitudes, and the computed temperature rise at latitude 80 degrees south could start rapid deglaciation of West Antarctica, leading to a five meter sea level rise. So this was, 1978, we had these sorts of um, projections coming through. And what, what, what happens is, um, just to provide some context as to why East Antarctica might still be intact and, and the West Antarctica is, is losing all the ice, that happens because the East Antarctic is grounded above sea level, so it's, it's largely continental rock, and the ice sits above sea level. The West Antarctic sits below sea level, so when any, when any warm water comes in and nibbles away the edges, it can cause rapid um, decay of the ice. So that's why the West Antarctic is particularly vulnerable and stores that five meters of sea level rise, um, five meters of sea level rise in it. So that was a prediction. It didn't have any, um, any evidence to support the case, but um, the Andrew Project uh, which was in the, in the 2000s and a number of drilling projects before that um, had some really remarkable discoveries. This was a, a multinational um, large logistical project which drilled um, into the, the marine sediments in the Ross Sea. Um, and it's a, a bit before my time as a, as, a, as a researcher, but it was the first time to really reveal what happened the last time the Earth was above 400 parts per million during the warm Pliocene period. So it was an extremely uh, amazing uh, engineering feat. So it drills through the ice shelf, using the ice shelf as a, a floating platform, then through the, the water column and then into the sediment. Um, it was the deepest geological borehole in Antarctica. Um, and it also provides the largest or the longest uh, geological record um, or rock, rock core recovery um, so it's pretty re remarkable with the sort of technology considering that the ice is flowing and there's tidal flexure going on as well. Um, so what, what these layers reveal 
from um, from uh, a record like this is, is that you have these open ice conditions where these diatomaceous oozes form where you've got uh, marine organisms that are existing in the water column and then they die and fall down and so you get this kind of layer of seafloor which is filled with of diatoms, then you have the uh, sort of more like the present, uh, so that's a warm world scenario, then you have the, the present ice shelf sort of conditions where you've got um, this middle middle slide here where you've got sediment from floating ice that comes falling in and you've got some sort of layering that, as well and then, and then the big bulldozer comes in carrying large boulders and um, this is the sort of full glacial or ice age type scenario where the entire um, the entire um, area of the ice shelf is effectively pushed further afield and, and the Antarctic continental ice is flowing and grounding into bed um, and you have these thick, um, thick ice sheets forming in, in, the, uh, in the, the Ross Sea here. And so this, um, this is a nice model that sort of illustrates some of those different situations. So this is the first time that the geological evidence had really matched up with what some of the models were predicting and so then they could refine the models to tune them appropriately with the right climate forcing to try and simulate how the Antarctic ice sheet might respond to these um, conditions and, and, and put some timestamps on them too to get some understanding of how the ice sheets might be changing through time. Um, and so it was really remarkable that the combination of the models and, and, the, and the geological evidence working together for, for the first time um, so what then kind of stemmed from that is it gave us an idea of a threshold. So 400 ppm seemed to be the threshold of collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So we knew at 300 ppm the ice sheet was intact, um, but then when we get to 400 we lose that West Antarctic and then 500 we actually start to eat away at the East Antarctic too and then we really start to, um, to see significant changes. So we kind of know where we'll end up, but we don't quite know how long that might take. And we still currently don't really know what exactly that temperature threshold is to understand when this irreversible melt might start. We also don't quite know what level of atmospheric CO2 that would be, but being over 400 ppm, most people would say that that's a pretty good number there. Um, how resilient is the system to ocean warming or atmospheric warming? We know we have from the marine record um, some proxies for atmospheric temperature, but we don't have any proxies for, uh, for, for ocean temperature, sorry, we don't have any atmospheric temperature proxies at the moment. So how long can we stay above 400 ppm before we see Antarctic respond? what sort of temperatures are we working with, when we see that response, um, we're trying to isolate some of those feedbacks because there's a number of different things at play here, including some ice physics that people aren't really, there's still a lot of um, discussion around what is and isn't feasible to cause some of this rapid decay of ice. Um, and also trying to set up a number of observe, observing, observing systems to predict some of those changes before it's too late and they just come and, and kind of strike so this is a, a recent model to Quantum Pollard of um, some of the sea level projections over the next 100, and, 100 years and, and beyond. So first if we just look at the first graph, again we've got these three lines. So the green line is the sort of rapid, uh, uh, rapid carbon drawdown or, or rapid reduction of, of carbon um, or burning of fossil fuels and then again that, that, that that blue line is where we see this Trump style of burning where it kind of pings off and we see uh, rapid uh, uh, melt of, of Antarctica. And what's interesting is around 2050 is where we see this kind of line deviate. So these are just models, there's no evidence constraining this at the moment, but um, obviously the next 10 to 20 years, as a lot of the recent reports suggest, is when we have the best opportunity to choose what path we want to take. Um, and then if you if you bring and so sorry these are error bars too so what we ha what we have is we could potentially see even by the end of this century upwards of, of two meters that's an extreme case scenario two meters of sea level rise 
but the, the conservative estimates, even if we did stop burning all fossil fuels today, we'd probably get, um, we're committed to at least half a metre, um, perhaps more, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty around you know, half a metre and two metres, and so if you're a planner or you're living in a coastal community, having a, a good understanding about this is, is a bit difficult, um, but generally speaking, they, they've set um, two metres as a sort of a limit to, to a lot of the planning, saying you shouldn't even think about anything below two metres to stay on the safe side. And then, of course, what happens when we project that into the, the, the 22nd century is that's when we really start to see significant change. Um, but interestingly, if we stay below two degrees um, and, and really work in the next 10 to 20 years, we can potentially contain a lot of that ice and prevent it from melting. Um, but of course, if we don't, that's when we see this significant shift and upwards of five, perhaps even more than 10 metres of, of sea level rise, depending how quickly uh, the ice sheets respond. So these models here, they're, um, so this is 1950, and it's going to forecast us into the future. And if we just watch how, how it plays out, keeping an eye on the, the year. Oh. So if we, if we watch, so 2050, we start to see a lot of that decay kick off, and then we really start to see things change next century, losing a big lot, a, a large area of the West Antarctic, and then as it continues to forecast out, what we see in the red is the, the bedrock, so bedrock starts to get exposed in Antarctica, starts to nibble away at the East Antarctic and some of these marine basins as well, and uh, it will finish up around 2500. So we can see what sort of path we're getting on, and it's really, it's really hard to stop this once it starts. It's a bit like a positive feedback. Once you open or, or take the ocean, uh, take the ice out of the equation, then you have the reduction of the albedo effect. So the, the, the sunlight comes in, heats the ocean up further. And instead of having the white ice reflecting that heat, the ocean absorbs that heat, and then the ice continues to melt. And so you're committing. Um, once you, you go past the threshold, you're committing um, total decay of the, of the Western Antarctic ice sheet. Um, you then have to have significant warming to, to lose the, the East Antarctic. So that's, that's the loss of the ice. And now this model is the same um, going forward, but this is showing surface melt. So what we have here is we know that this warm ocean is coming in and melting Antarctica from the bottom up but we don't quite know yet how the atmospheric warming is going to respond. At the moment it's cool enough that we're not seeing large melt, we're not seeing a lot of rain. In Greenland we do see these big melt pools forming, we do see a, um, sort of rivers flowing on the tops of these ice sheets, but we're not seeing it in Antarctica yet. But if we let this one play out, we will see, again, at that 2050 point is when we saw this rapid decay of ice, and so we also see around 2050 here, we start to see the surface melt kicks off, and that's when you start to see top-down melt, so you've got melting coming from the warm ocean, and then also from the top down. So at the moment, Antarctica is shut off from this warming, so we're not seeing it yet. Um, but because of the high elevation of the East Antarctic, um, it's sufficiently cool enough or isolated enough that we're not seeing that warming happening yet in the East Antarctic significantly warm, um, perhaps go to sort of 600 ppm type territory to, to get into that space. I don't think that would be a, a terrible experiment to try and do. Um, so this is a big challenge. We have no atmospheric temperature proxies before uh, uh, 800,000 years, so we have one from these, these air bubbles um, in the ice pools. But then if we go further back into these warm Pliocene intervals like 3 million years ago, we don't have that information yet. Antarctica doesn't have vegetation or pollen like other parts of the world where you can core into a lake and look at past vegetation and reconstruct how the climate's changed because there's different tree species or there's different mosses. Um, in the marine environment, they've got all of these um, diatoms and other um, marine organisms. So these microfossils stored in the sediment allow us to reconstruct the past temperatures of the ocean. But the, the atmosphere doesn't, the, the terrestrial 
um, components of Antarctica that don't give us those tools. So, okay, so that's where I come into it. So that's a nice introduction, I think, um, to, to kind of paint the picture of some of the problems that we have and that we're trying to figure out. And so what my work is trying to do is trying to figure out what some of these atmospheric temperatures are that can cause some of this top-down melt or what some of these thresholds are um, using some new tools. And so what we've done here in, uh, in the dry valleys is we've visited three sites in 2014, um, a range of different environments in different locations. Um, so at the top here we've got uh, the right valley. So this is a low elevation site, a fairly young site, um, and it's fairly active. And then we've got Pierce Valley in the middle and the Table Mountain. So just to provide some context of elevation, so it's about 300 metres across to sea level, then getting up to 400 or 500 metres in Pierce Valley there, and then up at Table Mountain at 1900 metres, significantly colder. And so if we go through each of these sites, what we have, this is the lower right valley here. So when we come out, we, we, fly, we fly down five hours in the US Air Force plane and then spend a few days at Scott Base getting our equipment ready um, before we go out into the field and then we'll camp for several weeks in the field. And so you can see our camp in, in the background there. Um, so so the helicopter will drop us in, in with all of our equipment and, and then we, we were drilling these permafrost layers. So you can see the upper 20, 20 or 40 centimetres there is uh, loose sand. It's fairly, um, uh, it's effectively, it's very similar to sand on a beach. It can be quite pebbly on the surface. But then once you go beyond that active layer, you hit a, a permafrost horizon and then the sediment is completely frozen. So imagine sand on a beach, um, but the, instead of the matrix of, of the, in between the pores of the grains uh, being water, it's entirely frozen. So you've got these frozen blocks of sand effectively. Um, so it's about 95% sand with, with the pores of water in between. So you've got this, this kind of fossil permafrost record that allows us to look at some of the past conditions. Um, and so what we're particularly interested in, while we don't have pollen, we do have bacteria. So we have fossil bacteria preserved in these permafrost landscapes that are indicative of the last time that landscape was unfrozen. So an active layer has active bacteria moving around, existing. Once it freezes, they're effectively locked in time. So we now have a fossil record of the bacteria, but we can't visually observe um, bacteria like we can with pollen, so we have to look at it from a molecular level, so we have to extract the DNA. So what we do at each of these sites is we are trying to extract permafrost cores to understand what sorts of conditions these bacteria were living in. So we've picked three different sites for this exact reason, so we can compare these with modern assemblages. So this is the young, very active site. So what we have in uh, low elevation sites in the dry valleys, ironically, um, they get quite wet in the summer. Um, so they can become the wet valleys. And you get this ephemeral melt kind of happening over the summer season when temperatures get up above zero. And you see these melt streams forming off, um, off the, the glaciers coming in. So these are actually teeming with life. There's mosses, there's uh, all sorts of different assemblages of, of microbial life. Um, cyanobacteria on the lake sides um, and springtails, you know, very, very small invertebrate flip rocks, so you can see these tiny springtails um, as well. So it's very active and, and it's, um, it's becoming uh, greener as well. There's mosses and, and lichens and things starting to form. And this is um, obviously of significant interest as Antarctica continues to get warmer and wetter. What sorts of ecosystems are we going to see? Are we going to see invasive species coming in? What does that look like? So then we fly up over Blood Falls and Taylor Glacier there. So that's an iron rich ooze coming out of the front of Taylor Glacier. So we flew over that. Um, and then we arrived in Pierce Valley, which is kind of a moonscape landscape, significantly older than the lower right valley, but about 120,000 years old, these deposits. Um, so kind of the last war period. So. Um, had a big ice age and then, um, and then 
today. So what this environment tells us is that it's been preserved for some time, but not quite as long as, um, as the, the, the final site of Table Mountain, but it, it gives us a different elevation and a different environment for us to record against some of these assemblages. And also, um, as we get older, extracting the bacteria becomes increasingly more difficult because they are further degraded and it's extremely complex. So as we go further back in time, we notice significant challenges with reliable DNA extraction. Um, so that's another reason why we've chosen different timestamps as well as different environments. So as we're drilling, we're pulling, the, the process is the same at every site. Um, it just gets progressively colder as you move further up the, up the um, in elevation. So what happens in, in, in Antarctica is with the that lapse rate is for every thousand meters you get 10 degrees of cooling. So as you go up, it gets significantly colder as you um, go up in the field. And so we're extracting these short pores. You see these 10 centimeter pores with the red caps on them. So we would pull out a core, perhaps 20, 30, 40 centimeters, put it in a core liner there, and then in a sterile way, we would um, uh, we would chip off each of the each of the pieces of permafrost and then place it in one of these core line core barrels, and then keep them in the, in the chili bins for storage. Um, and so, the really important not to contaminate the bacteria, of course. So all of this had to be done in a sterile sterile way. And then what we do is actually, so just to show you how, how old some of these landscapes are, these are, this is Tafani, some of these big boulders get sculpted and abraded by the sand and the wind over time. So literally, sometimes it can feel like someone's picked up a, a, a handful of sand and thrown at you. Um, so this is happening um, over thousands of years to these rocks. So you get these really unusual um, features forming from, the, from these different erosive processes here. Um, so these are just two examples, but as you can see, it looks very much like a moonscape, much older than the active landscapes um, in, the, in the lower right valley. And so this is also really important for us because um, we want to preserve permafrost for these hundreds of thousands of years so we can be sure that the bacteria is indicative of that time. And so not with these boulders, I'll, I'll show you a slide slightly later about what we do to try and get some age control. So at the moment I've just talked about extracting the bacteria and trying to understand what sort of habitat they live in, but we have no idea actually how old they are. Um, so this is a third site, Table Mountain, uh, much, much colder, minus 20, minus 30 degrees, just on, on average um, at about 1900 meters. Um, and so again, same process, extracting the core and putting it in core barrels. But, um, oh, and so sorry, we also surface the, the surface samples um, from these environments too. So it's important to obviously sample the surface and then also the permafrost to ensure that they're different. If they're the same, um, it's likely we've had some contamination in the permafrost core because they are totally different environments from, um, from, to, from today, from when the permafrost was was placed. So these are big boulders that have been transported by ice and then subsequently deposited as the ice has retreated. And we have sampled a series of these boulders right next to where we have drilled. And why we've done this is we're trying to understand the age of these landscapes to understand how old this permafrost is and how long the bacteria have been frozen in time. So what we use is a process called cosmogenic exposure dating. Um, which effectively is um, when a surface gets exposed, it starts to get bombarded with cosmic radiation. So supernova explosions from stars um, emit this cosmic radiation through space and then interacts with the upper atmosphere on Earth, and then we get this kind of cosmic shower of particles. Um, so they're happening all the time. And in the quartz minerals and, and rocks, we can measure the accumulation of beryllium and aluminium, beryllium 10 and aluminium 26, Specifically, which these are not produced on Earth. So these nuclides are not produced on Earth naturally. So we know that once a rock becomes exposed, the clock starts. So then we knock the top of these boulders off. And then we can measure how much beryllium 10 has accumulated over time. And then calculate the exposure age of these rocks. So this is an extremely valuable tool to reconstruct um, past glacial landscapes in particular, all sorts of landforms, but in particular 
um, places where ice has retreated um, and the bedrock exposed waters, boulders have been transported. So we've now got an age control and we've now got a proxy. Of course, um, this is part of my PhD and so we're still working through all of these things. So at the moment this is an approach. Um, so I don't have any exciting uh, news or um, evidence to share with you guys today. I'm just kind of currently working through all of these things. Um, but I've kind of talked through this, but basically there's kind of two components to this. The, the extraction of the, of the microbes from the cores, as well as measuring down core some of the, um, the beryllium as well to ensure that the landscape hasn't been disturbed or had some disturbance um, over time or um, there's been a deposition and then a pause or a hiatus and then a subsequent deposition that it is all one deposit which would mean that all the bacteria would be reflected with that deposit as well and then of course the, the boulders of the erratic surface sampling to get some age, age constraints as well and then what we can do is using the modern bacterial assemblages where we know what the current bioclimatic variables are, we can then use those and the ancient material to develop a transfer function effectively to create a um, reconstruction of what the past conditions were based on our known assemblages of the, the modern samples. Um, and from that then, we can reconstruct some of these past atmospheric conditions. So that's the approach for the PhD. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really exciting project, it's a very experimental one. So um, that's a bit of a context about that. And so I also kind of want to talk a little bit about um, what that actually means for us. So I've talked about sea level rise more broadly, and climate change and how Antarctica is going to change. And, um, but in New Zealand in particular, if we look at uh, the Southern Ocean, um, or actually as a, as a sort of a global engine room, if you like, um, it's the only ocean that's connected to all the others. So it's connected to the Indian, the Atlantic, and the Pacific, and you've got this this kind of circumpolar current that's driving it around, and um, it stores enormous amounts of heat, carbon dioxide, and nutrients. It actually absorbs more than forty percent of the Earth's um, CO two. Um, and it drives a lot of global ocean circulation, forming currents from wind changes in um, water densities. But of course, if we melt all of this ice, then we're putting a lot of fresh water into a saltwater system, which naturally is going to change a lot of the circulation, which will ultimately have significant impacts on, um, on global climate and ocean circulation as well. And so we're right at the bottom of that in New Zealand too. So we're, you know, when we get a subway, we get feel it. But the same same thing happens the other way. So when we have warmer incursions, they can actually propagate further south. So as the um, the circumpolar current, which is driven by the western winds, exchanges these kind of gases between the ocean and the atmosphere, um, we will see a lot more of this change. Um, but what happens is as the as the kind of the barrier or the boundary weakens as we see the westerly winds shifts shift further south, uh, where we will see um, a lot more of the warm propagation coming further south down into the Antarctic, but then also cold um, water and cold um, uh, pressure systems, or polar pressure systems coming up further north as well. So this, this barrier between the, the Southern Ocean and, and, and the sort of temperate conditions here in New Zealand will, will become weaker. Um, so th this there's a lot of um, uncertainty around this. Ocean modeling is extremely complex. You've got all sorts of eddies splaying off, and um, I'm not an expert in that. Um, but um, but we can, for sure, we, we need to have much more effective monitoring systems and having equipment throughout, so we've got large data sets to understand how this is changing. Um, okay, so, but more broadly, what does it mean for us here in New Zealand? So, if, um, if sea level rose by 30 centimetres in Auckland, the once in a century storm would happen every four years. So um, Tamaki Drive is effectively underwater quite a lot. Um, and, and then if we rise, centimetre, uh, rise sea level by 70 centimetres, uh, it would make it monthly. Um, so uh, you know that's, that's potentially in the second half of this century, in our lifetimes, or, or many of our lifetimes. Um, 
And so once it reaches a, a 1 in 20 year event, it is likely that uh, insurance companies will, will no longer renew policy. So we've got, now we've got a, a challenge with insurance um, around some of these properties. Uh, who pays for that? Is that, is that something like uh, an earthquake commission sort of a situation where the government pays back, buys back houses? Um, we don't know. Um, but about 68,000 buildings are below the one metre mark, carrying a replacement value of about 19 billion in New Zealand. Um, nearly 170,000 buildings within three metres of the mean high water mark, uh, high water spring. So, so what happens, of course, when we get a king tide, this is all amplified as well. Um, so all of the sea level rise, we get these big storms, flood events. Um, I mean, we've just seen the West Coast, some big challenges as well. Yep. I just read in the paper today about the new airport terminal runway that they're thinking of planning. In Auckland? Yeah, oh, yeah. it's right on the coasts. Do you think that they're factoring much of this in? They're estimating it'll cost $5 billion to build. Um, Is that just good money after bad? Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't, re I haven't read that, but uh, you would hope that it would be uh, sufficiently high. But, I mean, that whole, the whole airport is effectively just on the mangrove place there, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure, um, but, but that will be interesting. Um, but of course, yeah, and, and of course, if all of these buildings are lost, the cost will be uh, about 52 billion to replace. Um, so it's kind of interesting. You know, in New Zealand, we have this deep love for the environment, and we all feel very connected to it. But it's kind of more um, sense of um, pride than responsibility. I don't think anyone really takes much responsibility, um, and I think we need to get a bit better at that. Um, and of course, we're a maritime nation, so uh, we're actually the fourth largest exclusive economic zone in the world. So New Zealand is largely a marine continent, it's, um, the eighth continent, um, Zealandia. Um, it's a huge um, marine landscape, but, but most people don't even know that. Um, so it extends all the way halfway to Tonga, um, the Bakumitic Islands, and then all the way down to South Antarctic. Um, and so some of the impacts on sea level from, from our largely maritime national, you know, direct impacts on, on the urban areas, crops, um, agricultural areas, um, conservation areas, so a lot of our conservation estate is, is coastal as well. What implications does that have, both on, on the parks themselves, but also on, on the wildlife that live in those parks? Uh, indirect impacts as well, relocation, resettlement, migration perhaps, uh, indirect impacts on some of the agriculture, food security. Of course, New Zealand is a uh, we depend on growing things, uh, primary industries, uh, agriculture and, and fisheries, so um, climate naturally is going to have a huge impact on, um, on our primary industries as well. Um, and also uh, in decrease, uh, increasing biodiversity loss. So this is a, um, we're starting to see a massive decline in insects around the world. We don't really know what sorts of impacts it's going to have. Um, there's all sorts of challenges there around biodiversity loss related to climate change too that um, that aren't really well understood. Um, of course, if we lose biodiversity, that lowers system performance. Um, so we have additional challenges in agriculture as well, for example. Um, so it can be extremely catastrophic for ag fisheries and, uh, and horticulture too. Okay, so, um, and so Peter Blake, um, he was noticing this you know, 20 plus years ago, he was sailing in the Southern Ocean, riding the westerly winds in the Volga Ocean Race, or what was then the, the Woodbury around the World Ocean Race, and uh, he started to notice there was changes going on back then. Uh, and in my first couple of round the world races, our yachts when in the Southern Ocean would be surrounded by large albatross day after day in all weathers. As the years went by, I raced every four years or so through the waters and I noticed there were fewer and fewer of these great birds. The last time through the Indian Ocean in 1994, we were lucky to see one large albatross a week. So largely, I think a lot of this was bycatch from the fisheries and, and impacts from fisheries, but um, more broadly, we were seeing a lot of these changes across um, all sorts of different environments around the world. And, and Peter was one of the sort of first people to really talk about this in New Zealand. Um, and so after his competitive sailing part of his career, he then wanted to shift his attention towards engaging people who care about the environment. And so he started Blake Expeditions, um, 
to do that, and it was the beginning of a, a five-year odyssey to some of these environmental pulse points all around the world. And so started in the Antarctic, and then they went into Patagonia, and up into the Amazon, where unfortunately he was, he was killed, but the, the plan was then to go up into the Arctic and round and then uh, back into the Pacific. Um, and what he noticed was that if young people experience the environment, they will learn to love it. And if they love it, they will want to take care of it. And so that's effectively the essence of, of what um, we're trying to do at Blake, is continue Peter's living legacy to inspire um, environmental leadership in the next generation. Um, so the next part of the talk is, is we've kind of outlined the nature of the problem and what sort of um, issues we have, and now this next part is about what we're doing with, with some young people to try and engage them and, and get more people excited and actually um, get some action about what we can do to, to make a difference and try and um, curb some of the challenges that we face over the next 10 or 20 years and beyond. So we run a series of experiential uh, learning programs with uh, high school and university age students. Um, so this is uh, Blake Inspire program, used to be called the Youth Environmental Leaders Forum. We take 55 students from all over, <coughs> all over New Zealand uh, each year uh, between uh, the term one and term two holidays and uh, the whole week is uh, hands-on, um, fun, uh, outdoor learning exercises followed by workshops and um, it's done in partnership with the Ministry for the Environment. So these students come in, they might be the only student in their school that's interested in the environment and then they've suddenly found 55 like-minded young people and really gives them a huge energy boost, um, a bit like a booster shot, if you like, for uh, environmental change back in the school and community. And so then they develop action plans um, from the skills that they learn visiting different sites. So this is up in Lee, we learned about marine reserves and, and ocean health. Um, there's, uh, we can tend to have different themes of climate change, biodiversity, um, ocean health, fresh water, for example. And so they then go back into their schools and, and then start to try and create change through recycling, composting, or um, some more ambitious programs too, like trying to remove uh, the plastic wrapping from all the NCA exams across the country. Um, so there's some really uh, ambitious students trying to take on some big challenges and, and we're really excited about that and, and two students from our program are actually the leaders of the strike, the climate strike from uh, a few weeks ago. So um, it's really exciting to see them kind of start to step up and take on some of those uh, leadership responsibilities uh, more broadly beyond our programs. And so this is kind of the, the beginning of the pipeline of programs for us. So out of those students, they are then eligible to participate in Blake expeditions where we travel to some of these uh, environmental pulse points in New Zealand um, with the Navy. So we'll select uh, sort of 15 to 20 of these students for one of these voyages with a team of scientists and other experts doing hands-on science in the field, learning about some of New Zealand's most wild and, and important um, places. So. Um, of course, throughout some of these expeditions, we have to build resilience. So for several days, we might be traveling in nice blue skies, and then of course, we go to the Southern Ocean and come across a nice eight meter swell, and then you don't see anyone for 24 hours because they're just sleeping in cabins. Um, so it's all about building resilience and leadership as well as the environmental knowledge. If we can't go back into our communities and, um, and be able to engage others and connect with others, then we have failed. So we've had four of these expeditions now, uh, two up to the Kermadex and two down to the Southern Antarctic to the Orkin Islands. And so these are right at the edges of New Zealand. So the Kermadex um, is, is our northernmost point, 1,000 kilometres northeast of the North Island, and it takes about 48 hours to get there, about halfway to Tonga. And it's only one of four marine protected areas in the world identified as pristine because it is no take and force old and isolated and it's a unique place because it sits right between tropical and temperate waters so you see a very unusual biology or, or, or uh, ecosystem there where you've got temperate species that you would see in New Zealand as well as uh, more tropical species that would come down from um, the Indo-Pacific or from, from Tonga for example um, 
and it's one of New Zealand's largest marine reserves and it has hundreds, hundreds of Galapagos sharks and other apex predators, which is a sign of a healthy ecosystem when you have the large apex predators. Um, and what was amazing is uh, we actually discovered, or we didn't discover, we observed three species of fish on this expedition that had never been observed in this area before. Um, there's still a lot of discovery to do and so we still need to establish a really good baseline of what we're actually working with there so then we can measure change as we start to see warm waters shifting further south and more of these tropical species shifting further south. Um, we're starting to see that now even in the tip of the North Island, um, whale sharks, more sea turtles, even sea snakes are starting to come down into New Zealand waters. Um, so these are new challenges that we face and we, we actually don't really know what we're working with the moment and so of course we always want to uh, take the students out of their comfort zone so uh, we, we, when we were out snorkeling with scientists we were swimming with these Galapagos sharks trying to observe other species they're kind of like boisterous teenage dogs so they're not going to um, bite you unless you get them in the corner and really agitate them so um, they're, yeah, they're really safe they're not too bad you know, meter, meter. But uh, of course we didn't tell the students that six months earlier they were great like swimming that we were learning. <laughs> so we, we take the students out to learn with the scientists in the field in hands-on ways and then from the samples that they collect during the day, oh sorry, and so also when we were there we were collecting plankton and, uh, and, and we had a beta remote underwater video camera so we were observing uh, footage um, when, we're, when we're, um, we, we would leave the cameras for, for, for the night or, or during the day and then put them up and see what what animals or, or what species we could observe. Um, and then in the evenings we would go through all that data and information. So there's a, a marine algae, we need analysis from NEWA, um, identifying, identifying species working with the students around um, what, what we have there. And um, this is another thing, uh, seaweeds and, and marine algaes and, and marine plants are huge sinks of carbon. They're more effective at absorbing carbon, five, more than five times more effective rainforest or, or, or forest on land and so this is something that's um, often been a bit overlooked I think is thinking about using the ocean as a sink with the marine um, plants um, as a tool of course this isn't included in any of the um, uh, carbon counting because it's extremely complex and we have all sorts of new um, challenges to um, to any of the carbon accounting that countries do with ETS and things like that but, um, but from a, a solution approach I think improving landscapes to, um, to have more of these uh, marine um, plants and, and marine ecosystems restored again is extremely valuable for sequestering um, carbon and, and drawing down a lot of that carbon that we've lost over the last 100 years or so. Okay, and then the sub-Antarctic, the other end. So um, again, this is the bottom, the other end of New Zealand where we're right at, at the confluence of these um, temperate and, and um, and polar waters um, a bit further south, um, but it takes about 30 hours to get there from Dunedin. Um, it's described as the Galapagos of the Southern Ocean. It's extremely rich in biodiversity. The UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's home to some of New Zealand's most iconic species. Um, but we, because it's so remote and difficult to get to, we actually know more about Antarctica than we do about many of our sub-Antarctic islands. Um, so there's a lot of work to do and a lot of um, baseline understanding around what we actually have there. It's similar to the Kermitics because how can we measure change in some of these places if we don't know what was there in the first place? And so again, if we think back to the challenges with how the temperature is responding with relation to our increase in carbon dioxide, some of these um, sites might, might provide us early warning tools or we start to identify change in the biology in some of these places, then we might know that there are other changes coming far earlier than other tools might be able to predict. So again, we're taking students out, learning with the scientists, interacting with New Zealand sea lions and other animals in really unusual places. This, so this is several hundred metres inland, high elevation site, and there's a sea lion in the forest. It's really weird. <laughs> this place is like out of a Dr. Seuss book. The contorted, rather stunted, rather trees, 
um, amazing, enormous mega herbs. Um, and these sea lions, uh, you know, they're in decline. They've got big challenges, as well as the iconic yellow-eyed penguin. A third of their population live in the Auckland Islands. They're also in decline, lowest numbers in 27, 28 years. Um, and of course, New Zealand's the seabird capital of the world. Um, so it's, it's teeming with these albatross. Um, and you can see the mega herbs on, on the cliff there as well. And so, as I mentioned, we're working with the students, with the scientists, they're learning about the science. It's not, it's not, a, um, it's not an observation. They're, they're working and, and helping out and supporting me with them every night. They will sit down and look through the different samples that we collect and how to prepare them um, to then go back to the labs and, and, and be looked at when we come back into New Zealand. So, that's, um, oh yes, and also we have, uh, we bring teachers on board with us too, so um, we want to empower the teachers and, and, and give professional development to teachers so they can then go back into the classrooms and inspire far more students. Um, so we take teachers on board to interact with us and learn with us as well, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity for the teachers to then go back into the schools and, and, and use some of those applied skills from the scientists that they that they've learned um, with some of their teaching in the classroom. And, and it, as I mentioned in the earlier program, what we also do is we, we are constantly thinking about when we get back home, what can we all do, what changes can we all make to reduce our impact. So we have a lot of discussions and workshops and evenings in the downtime, trying to help and support the students to come up with plans or ideas Predator control, it might be um, fresh water cleanups, planting, there's a number of different things that they're looking at doing. Um, so a lot of the mentoring we do, we don't just run these programs and, uh, and then finish and then let the students go work constantly kind of engaging with them afterwards and staying connected with them and helping support them as they develop new plans and goals. And uh, of course, when you take a small group of people, um, you can only provide a really rich and deep experience for a few, but if you can take the environment into the classroom, then you can empower many. So one of our newest projects, the NZVR project we're really excited about is we've partnered with New Zealand Geographic and filmed a number of sites throughout the whole of Gilf North, and, uh, and these are, we have two educators going into schools every day in, in Auckland this year which we'll see over 20,000 students throughout the year. Um, so we're taking the ocean into the classroom now, which means you don't need to know how to swim, you don't need to be afraid of sharks, and there's no health and safety forms to fill out. So the teachers love it too. Um, and it's really immersive. It's amazing how much of an empathy machine the VR really is. Um, and the great thing is you don't need the fancy expensive headset if you have a cardboard headset and a cell phone with an internet connection, you can still connect. Um, of course, it's not quite as immersive, but it's still incredibly powerful to do this. So the access is not limited just to those who have the expensive headsets. Um, so just quickly, I'll show you a couple of the videos that we show the students. So we show them what a pristine ecosystem looks like. This is a poor nights here. Um, so people can can go and explore and understand what, you know, what does a healthy ecosystem look like? It's good water quality, lots of different species of fish, um, and you get a nice stingray to fly over your head. Um, and then of course we, we show them what a poor ecosystem looks like as well. Yes. So then we show them a poor ecosystem, and we ask them, why do these environments look different? And why might that be the case? So, we show a number of different videos looking at fishing, looking at plastic, looking at sediment runoff. Some of these challenges that we face, helping the students understand what some of these differences are. And it's amazing what we've, what we've noticed. The students are fully engaged, far more engaged than they would be if they were on a textbook or watching a video in a traditional sense. So these are really valuable new tools that we can use to teach, um, teach our young people. Um, Okay, and then back to Antarctica. So one of the other programs that we do is our Blaine Ambassador program. 
and um, so this is for um, university age students. So this is Harry Sager. He was in Antarctica in, in February this year, and uh, he has just released a, a podcast series, Antarctica and Frozen. And so there's ten episodes that he has recorded with scientists and Antarctica music and staff um, that you can listen to on, on Apple, Spotify, any podcast listening device. Um, and so he's, he's done an amazing job recording these. Um, and so we also, this is the more than 10 years this program's been going um, with Blake in Antarctica, New Zealand, and, and, and we've sent young people down to the ice to work um, in the field and then uh, come back and share, <coughs> share their knowledge and experiences as well. So uh, it's a really exciting program um, that we do. So that's, um, that's kind of an overview of the, of, of the programs that we run. And then, um, of course, when we talk about all of these, these climate problems, people say, well, what can I actually do? This is the, the important part. What can we, what can we do, right? Um, so here's kind of eight things, there's many more, but these are probably good places to start if, if anyone had a burning question, what, what can I do? So obviously plastic is, is produced and then transported, so that's burning fossil fuels. So we, we really, we're gonna quit the plastic. We've got to turn the tap off, we're not trying to clean it up. Um, so moving towards reusable bags, refusing plastic straw bags, etc. I'm pretty sure most of us have got to that point. Um, food is one of the biggest emitters we have, so trying to buy local, fresh, and in season. Um, of course, food has to travel using fossil fuels at the moment. Um, so the further it's been, the more carbon it's using. Food waste is a big one. Um, we want to reduce how much food waste we have. Food produces about 17 percent of your total emissions profile. So changing a diet is a massive way to think about, or, or reducing food waste is a massive way to, to reduce your own personal impact. Um, which of course leads to reducing meat and dairy consumption, it's healthier, um, and agriculture is responsible for a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in, embracing public transport, biking or getting electric vehicles um, if you can. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, but actually restoration, planting trees is one of the big, um, one of the best things we can do. Uh, there's still currently the best technology that we have to offset carbon emissions, um, unless we start big, you know, seaweed farms as well. But, um, but this, this uh, restoration of these natural habitats is a huge tool that we haven't utilized to really draw down a lot of this carbon. Letting nature take control again and restoring some of these habitats that we have degraded. Um, again, talking about climate change, I think it's really important we have to keep talking about these issues with everyone that we interact with. Um, can be sometimes a bit complex or challenging, depending if it's you know your crazy uncle at Christmas or whatever it is. But um, we have to keep talking about these issues and we have to keep improving our performance personally and across work and, and, and in all sorts of different sectors. So try and do this as much as you can at work, at home, wherever you can. Um, it's really important. Um, and trying to develop good systems in place at work, you know, keep cups, sushi containers that just sit in the office. It's really, it's really great, you know, if you have these kind of boomerang keep cups or, or sushi containers in, in the kitchen at work, then you don't have to take the, you, you can just take basically a lunchbox, even if you forget one, to, to go and buy sushi each day or your coffee or whatever it is. Um, just simple things like that. And just keep kind of developing and building on um, what you might have done last week and improving. Um, and then all, the last one is um, to donate to environmental organisations if, if you can. So. The environment represents less than 3% of donations to charities. And um, I think it, it, you know, the environment, it's, it's tricky because it doesn't quite target the heartstrings like some of the other challenges we have. But of course, all of those challenges don't matter if the environment is so degraded that it's going to cause more harm than the problems we have today. So I think that that's really important as well. And um, I know some of you just took photos these are also, it's really easy, I've made a Herald article about this, so just go on the Herald and you can actually find all this information because I actually, I've said this so many times, I need to just make something so everyone has an easy way to one. 
to access these kind of things. Quick question, can yeah. I ask why air travel didn't make the list? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess that, that embrace public transport and reducing emissions is, is one thing um, I could have put it on there. In New Zealand actually do a really good um, carbon neutral flying option now where you can offset your flights. So if you do choose the offset and pay the extra few dollars, it does offset the flights. Of course, you are still emitting carbon dioxide. So it's it's not a, a foolproof solution. Wow. And air travel is one of the, the main yeah. culprits. So yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Sure, right? yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but um, yeah, maybe I need to make nine. Something cruise line is it? Oh, cruise liners, yeah, they're terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hotel that just burns fossil fuels all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, uh, um, that's, that's definitely a, a big challenge too. I mean, yeah, there's, there's many, many more, but um, these, these are just a few to kind of start with. On your natural habitat, um, just earlier, George Mombiet in The Guardian posted a piece on the natural world can help save us from climate catastrophe, talking very much about what you're saying there, so if anyone's interested in reading on that further, it's quite a good article. Yeah, no, he, he's, he's a great, he, he writes really great and interesting stuff mm. all the time. How does your uh, CO2 level relate to solar irradiance? Because don't forget, all of the energy in this world comes from the sun. And as I've been studying for the past eight or nine years as much as I can. Now I've been retired for 15 years. My hobby is science and physics. And most of the erudite scientists I've read about, such as Freeman Dyson and his ilk, say that CO2 does not affect global temperatures, only in a very minor way. The main contributor to the greenhouse effect is water vapor. 90% effect is water vapor in the air. And then the remainder of it is CO2, perhaps, and other gases. But only 5% of that CO2 is human human derivation. <clears throat> the major change you'll find if you follow the solar irradiation, the CO2 levels follow that more closely than anything else. In fact, they lag by about 18 months to two years. And at the moment, we're just tailing off the end of a major solar irradiation level. And Mr. Gore's hockey stick graph is a, a, a carry on from that slope, which is now finished. We're now entering a solar minimum, minimum for perhaps the next 30 years. And the temperatures continue to rise? No, it won't continue. They are going to go down. Because as the solar irradiation goes up, it releases CO2 from the oceans in a big way. As you correctly said, 40% of the CO2 is in the ocean. There's probably more CO2 in the cold water around Antarctica and the north because it dissolves more gas when it's colder. When we heat the sea up, it releases the CO2, but it reaches a, an equilibrium point. Now, if you have a good read of other people, I know you, what you've been studying there, that it's all based on CO2 being the cause. It's the effect of heating, not the cause of heating. Okay? But read the other scientists who are skeptics, but I've read both sides now. And I'm sure the, the, the real cause of all this is the fudged measurements in East Anglia and other places where they moved measuring devices from rural areas into urban areas to try and fudge the results. They admit they were found out to be lying. Now, the money, follow the money. The money is who's making the money out of the carbon tax? Who's doing the deals? Who gets a commission on it all? People who funded the research, the banks. The Federal Reserve of America, which isn't the Federal Reserve, it's a private bank. Can I ask a question, yeah. Jacob? Yeah. Um, you, in the urban, the Antarctic part, the ice sheets melting. Mm -hmm. um, you said the big unknown is we don't know, you know how fast things will happen. The rate is the challenge. We know where we're going, we don't know the rate. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I just wondered if you can tell us a little bit about what we know about. Past, so the last 20,000 or whatever it is mm -hmm. years, you know, the last ice age maximum was 25,000 years ago, we know that sea rose in mm -hmm. that period, right, was stabilised about 8,000 years ago, currently, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah so sort of or 7,000 ish. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. So, so, so we know that there were, can you just tell us a little bit about um, 
How fast? What was the fastest that no? Yes, so I, I didn't put a, um, a slide in about um, sea level from the last ice age. So last, in the last ice age, a lot of ice was locked up in the north, northern hemisphere and, and Antarctica as well. Sea level was 120 metres lower than today. And as that ice has, has melted, obviously the sea level's, sea level's gone up and there has been um, periods of very rapid sea level rise um, during this time. Um, in particular, Melbourne Pulse 1A, about 14,500 years ago, we saw about 20 metres of sea level, maybe 16 to 20 metres of sea level rise in about 400 years. So it's about 40 millimetres a year, which today uh, we're having 4 millimetres a year of sea level rise. So it's actually um, 10 times greater than the rate we see today. So we know that Antarctica can respond really quickly. Um, we've seen this in the past, obviously in slightly different conditions, but we know that that can happen. So do we know, so it was, it was melting, it started melting, you know, the last time I say, yeah. like 25,000 years ago. Do we know what, and so obviously it was melting at different rates until it stabilised 70,000 mm. years ago. Um, do we know that blip you're talking about where it sort of accelerated for 400 mm -hmm. years, 20 metres over four centuries? Uh, 400, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, you know, yeah, lifetime, yeah. that's a very Oh, for sure, you know, yeah, that's right. you know, four, four metres in, in, in a lifetime, effectively. Yeah. yeah, do we know why it accelerated for those four centuries? It's not well understood. Um, so, again, that, that might be just the point when you when you get hit one of these tipping points or these thresholds where you get to a certain temperature, you start to see this. this do, you, do you think ice sheet instability would be Maybe the fact that it goes it. Well, oh, definitely. One yeah, when the grounding line goes beyond and water, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, um, once once you open the floodgates, um, things can happen really quickly, and so um, it's 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 a, it's a possibility. Um, there's there's still so much unknown, um, especially around where that ice actually came from. So with this pulse, we don't know very well where that ice came from. Was it from Antarctica? Was it from the Northern Hemisphere? Still very poorly understood. And so we need to we need to collect more samples from right. basically the challenge too, right, is in the middle of the Ross Sea where potentially some of that ice came from. There's no mountains to record the evidence. So we have to drill, which is extremely expensive, through the middle of the ice shelf into the marine sediment. Um, and so this um, there's teams doing that, looking into that, but it's expensive, it takes time, and that's, uh, it's very challenging, yeah. yeah. Jack, my question is about um, what you know about the Fates Glacier. Yes. Which yeah. is, it may not be your city, um, but it's, it's been seen recently, it's in the news that it's, mm. it's kind of hollowing out underneath. Yeah. And at risk of breaking up, is, is that any part of what you no, no, so I, that's, that's not my work, but I'm um, obviously aware of, of Flates, because it's, it's, Flates is one of the, the sort of the, the most concerning um, glaciers in Antarctica at the moment, um, has a very large catchment, so basically once you take the plug out, it's a bit like taking a, a cork out of a bottle, then all this ice can just flow very quickly, and the warm water can then eat away at it, so you've got this fast flowing ice that then rapidly thins into a warm ocean, and then you see it. A rapid response. So the concern with flights is this rapid retreat that if we look at um, um, the, the bedrock beneath flights is below sea level, right? Yeah. Do you want to know how, how far, how deep below sea level is that surface bedrock? I'm yet? not sure off the top of my head, sorry. But if we look at so the, those really vulnerable parts of the West Antarctic. Yeah, here we go. So, we look at the vulnerable parts of the West Antarctic. Where's the mouse? What we see all through here, this is where it goes, because this is the, the warm water that's coming in, it's not buffered by a nice big ice shell, and then we see it go really quick. Um, but where we, where we see what happens is in, in the Ross Sea, which will happen a bit later, once you take the buffer out or, or that plug, that's when you see rapid retreat of the Ross Sea, but that kind of happens later. So we can just play the 3D. Um, I'll let it finish. Um, 
emissions profile because we have the biological emissions with the methane and then we also have the, the carbon emissions from, from energy and things but, um, but I think the zero carbon bill is on the right track to setting some targets, binding targets um, across parties um, but as to what we can actually do or what sort of policy we can actually do I think um, incentivizing businesses to be stewards and, and behave more responsibly is a good place to, to look at and um, and then putting a price on people who don't behave. So we have to incentivize. That's the only way, but also um, if, if people are getting away with it, I think plastic is artificially cheap because it ends up in the water and it harms our wildlife. Carbon is artificially cheap because we then, as taxpayers, pay for the storms and subsequent things. So. We need to somehow um, kind of put a cost on some of these things that currently people are getting away with for free. Yeah. Yep. Questions. Um, first question: What do you think is the reality of agricultural emissions being included in the zero carbon bill at any stage? Do you think it's realistic that it will ever happen, or some part of it be included? Or do you think New Zealand will kick up too much of the cost? I think I think it will. I don't know what that will look like. Um, Stella, so you might have a better idea than me on that, actually. Um, yeah, maybe not in the short term, but yeah. hopefully in the midterm. Yeah, it's, I think it's inevitable with that. Yeah, and um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, it's yeah, it's a really interesting one. The whole conversation. these kind of key pillars of New Zealand's economy and now we're going to have to see change and I think we, we might have to just um, 
figure out how we do this really effectively without causing too much harm. And just the second part of the question was um, looking at the VR stuff that you guys are doing, mm. what are the chances of that heading down south and around the entire country? Is that something that you guys are looking into? Yeah, long term we want to we want VR headsets in, in every um, classroom. Um, that was Peter's vision. He wants to reach every student in every school. Um, so ultimately, we think VR is the best way for us to do that. So long term, we want to film a number of sites all over New Zealand. So we can go to any biome, marine and on land, and, and every school in the country has access to one of these places pretty easily. Yeah. Is there any other links to those films uh, public? Yeah, so if you go to nzgeo.com forward slash VR, there's a full suite of 360 videos. You can look on a tablet, um, on a phone, or on a desktop, and then if you have a cardboard headset, you can flip it sideways and go into to VR mode as well. Right. Yeah. So you can yeah. publish those afterwards on the Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. Sure. Yeah. I have got a random, random technical question. Just your slides of the, was it the Auckland Islands? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Is that, what's the main forest? Is that the beach or is that something? It's Rata. It's Rata. Right? Yeah. There's no like beach down there at all? No parks? No. No? Okay. Which, you know, it's interesting because obviously in Antarctic areas, um, if, if we go further back in time, we do see these beach yeah, yeah. Um, uh, leaves and, and ponds. But, but in, in the Orkin Islands, it's, um, it's largely like a forest and all stunted. It's the southernmost place that the trees grow, actually. Yeah. Have you considered the effect in the end if we manage to reduce carbon considerably, carbon dioxide in the air, yeah, how our plants are going to grow? They'll grow exactly the same. No, well, they don't that, absorb CO2 in the same way. So. They did experiments in Germany in an enclosed environment with trees. Uh, so they're simulating the Amazon, for example. If we pump more oxygen into the air right yeah. now, you'll breathe exactly the same. Anyway. It's the same, it's the same equation. <coughs> We could do with more carbon dioxide so our plants grow a little better. One of the last questions, if it is. Anyone last then question? I, then I think uh, we can draw it the formal part, but then we can have yeah. formal discussions afterwards. Cool. Any last one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then, thank you again, uh, Jacob. That was a, a journey across many dimensions. Uh, in science through action and uh, a vision or a view into what the Blake Foundation is doing and uh, organisation training people for the future so thanks very much for that and yeah.